I'm here to introduce J.K. Sue, one of my colleagues in the management department, an awesome innovation scholar who's studying how firms translate scientific knowledge into innovation, so super relevant for today. He's here to introduce our next speaker, who is also a really good friend. So I will turn this over to J.K. Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, today, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Sean Hyatt from the USC's Marshall School of Business. Sean is an entrepreneurship and innovation scholar with deep expertise in the global energy and agribusiness sectors. His work spans more than 20 papers and covers renewables as diverse as biomass titled to nuclear. The impact of Sean's research has been recognized by such organizations as the Kaufman Foundation, the Academy of Management, as, as well as the Alliance for Research on Corporate Sustainability. In addition to being a prolific researcher in the area of energy and sustainability, Sean serves as the director of the Business of Energy Transition Initiative at USC, where he leads a multidisciplinary team of faculty, students, and industry partners to advance solutions in global energy. I could not think of a more fitting keynote speaker to address our audience. So without further ado, Sean, the floor is yours for the next hour. Thank you, JK, JK excuse me, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm happy and delighted to be here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hopefully this uh, screen share works. Can everyone see it's working? All right. <laughs> um, so uh, this is uh, the presentation I'm gonna talk about today is like how entrepreneurs can tackle the energy transition. And you've already heard two great entrepreneurs today uh, with uh, Carbon Quest and Deox, De Deox Cycle. Um, and I, what I'm gonna do today is actually kind of like span a little bit more. So I'm going deep into any one business like you've already heard. I'm gonna paint a broader picture of what the opportunities, where they, where they lie for this energy transition for entrepreneurs, for you that are interested in fact of maybe starting a company or investing in one. Um, and so to begin with, uh, we need to first kind of set the stage because with um, opportunities often derive from massive challenges. Entrepreneurs have to, you know, they, they see some sort of issue that they can solve and no one solved it yet. And so they jump in and that's what helps generate the value. So we're gonna begin now talking about, if you know, uh, a, a little bit about some of the transition challenges um, that we have here. Um, the first one is the population and economic growth. Um, so, you know, on this planet, we're, we're still growing in population. Um, as we see, like 22% more people will be on the planet from, you know, last year to 2050. And although the population should peak by the end of this century, we're still going to get about 2 billion more. And with more people come added energy use and consumption. And so we're going to need to produce more energy. Now, on that same time, an additional factor is that um, we have people moving up the socioeconomic ladder from the low income to middle income, and then even to high income. And as individuals move up these uh, economic ladders, their energy consumption also increases, right? Uh, as you can think about somebody who uh, walked in Africa, they can then afford a bicycle. And then what about a scooter or a, a powered scooter or even an automobile or moving to a smart telephone or a laptop? Or as we take for granted in the Western world, air conditioning. Okay, and this is something that we should applaud that we're seeing this growth up. In fact, if we look at the last five years, every year we've had about 100 million people move from that low income to middle income. And I just saw the latest report today that 113 million people this year will rise up into this middle income. Well, that's an increase of 135% in energy consumption per capita. So we have this massive growth a demand that's gonna be continuing to grow through the end of this century. We, we have to satiate that with energy sources. Now let's look at the, um, the types of energy that's happened in different sources over time from the beginning of the industrial revolution. What this chart maps is kind of like the, the adoption rate of new energy sources as they come off. Um, let's begin with coal. You see like in the first 50 years, right? After 50 years, coal took up about 35% of global energy. Um, and then when oil came on the scene later, after 50 years later, it was only 25%. Then we see natural gas 50 years later to 20. Nuclear, well, that peaked at 30 years and has since gone down. And then we see renewables right now. I mean, we're about 13 years into this from this chart of actually making the chart above 0%. And you know, if past is prologue, if history is any 
a pattern to this, we would probably see a similar type of adoption curve. Now, what's interesting if we look at this, right, and why is the case that we'd expect, well, why hasn't oil completely taken over coal or, or natural gas? Well, what we've seen is like more of this aspect of an energy addition over the years and less so of a transition. In fact, the only energy source in the Western uh, industrialized world that has completely been transitioned out has been animal dung, right? So that that no is no longer used. Um, but even biomass fuels like wood is still being used in like industrials as, as like an energy source. And so this is something we need to think about. It's like this adoption rate may be a bit slower if if you know all else holds in terms of like how the markets and the regulations were in place for these prior centuries for renewables. So this is something to think about as we think about like how fast can this go, this energy transition. Now, this is an interesting thing from the International Agency, uh, Energy Agency, the IEA. So they have their projected growth of energy demand through 2050. Um, and you can see like, um, obviously the demand, the supply is going to increase because we have that as a couple slides ago, more population and economic growth. Um, and as we see at the top, right, the renewables, so intermittent renewables like solar and wind, they're going to grow at about 3.3% cumulative um, average growth rate, a CAGR rate. So that's about three times growth we're going to see over that time period. But even among the legacy energy sources, we're still going to see a growth. I mean, coal's even going to be growing at a 0.4% predicted through 2050. Now, this what that makes this so interesting is that's also the date in which everyone's saying that this is where we're going to be carbon neutral. Now, perhaps it's because, you know, dioxide and carbon quests are going to be able to come and suck up all that carbon dioxide that, you know, has gone to the, as, as we continue, like the use of natural gas, coal in, in the liquids, right? They're going to be growing still, right? So this is something to think about for, for entrepreneurial opportunities. But in terms of hitting that carbon neutral goal of 2050, that is going to be extremely challenging and if not impossible at the predicted rates. Okay, because let's take a look at this. What is required then to stay on that net uh, 2050 target? Well, we would have to see essentially exponential growth in, uh, in basically five different areas. And one of them you've already seen today, which is that last one, the carbon capture, right? We would need to see 100% growth between, and this is back, and this was predicted in 2021, but essentially from 2021 till 2030. So that's like seven more years. <laughs> Right? We need to see six times more wind power capacity built and put out, 14 times solar, 14 times more battery electric cars, and 200 times green hydrogen. Okay, So uh, this is tremendous amount. And this is just to stay on target for 2050. It doesn't mean that we're going to be you know, net zero at 2030. It's just that's what's required for this growth at that point. So you know, to scale exponentially in like these green technologies. This is going to require a lot of minerals, which is where I'm going to go next as we talk about the minerals that are involved. Um, now, as we think about this, and I, I want to make this clear, that if we look back at the history of every extractive industry, whether that be petroleum or coal or copper, we've never seen in any one of these product categories a double of the supply within a decade. So it hasn't happened um, for many reasons. Um, technological as well as regulatory issues, right? So keep that in mind. But let's take a look at what's needed in terms of the minerals. Okay, and then again, you're going to see like why I'm bringing this up because there's a lot of entrepreneurial opportunities I'm going to be talking about very soon after we get through some of these challenges. Um, so if we take a look at the conventional car and compare it with an electric car, an uh, EV requires about five times more kilograms of minerals and metals than an internal combustion engine vehicle. And you're asking, well, wait a minute, how does that make sense? I mean, it doesn't have like an engine or a transmission, right? But when you think about it, an EV car, or excuse me, a conventional car is made mainly up of steel and aluminum, okay? And these are ores that are found in pretty dense locations all over the world. So the amount of extraction, we don't need to extract as much earth to be able to like refine and, and find that amount of ore. But for the batteries and the electric motors that are required for the electric vehicle, like we're dealing with chromium, molybdenum, uh, graphite, uh, manganese, some of these aspects where they're not in as dense composition 
um, as like aluminum and iron ore. Um, so this is just requires a lot more mining on that part. Now, and it's the same thing, actually, if you look at the electrical side, right, and how we generate electricity. So natural gas is the, the lowest and coal. But as we start moving down the list with like solar, uh, photovoltaic solar, onshore wind, and even offshore wind, the amount of uh, metals and the, the amount of mining, uh, on average, six times more minerals and mining than hydrocarbon power generation. So we're going to have to start thinking a little bit out of the box in terms of how we're going to get these minerals and metals. Um, this is another way to paint this, right? Uh, so as we think about this future clean energy demand, these are like the figures, again, not, not as uh, updated, but 2020, and then what the estimate is required. So by 2030, we're going to need about two times as more copper on the market being produced than we had in the year 2020. Um, graphite, 17 times more, 11 times more nickel, two times silicon, but this is the big one, it's the 18 times more in the lithium. Um, just on the current, using our current technologies right now. So tr tremendous amount, uh, where are we gonna get it? Well, we'll, we'll be getting that very soon. Um, now, this is another thing to think about. And in terms of like entrepreneurship, we also need to, and this, I teach global strategy also at the uh, University of Southern California. And you always have to put on your global strategy hat whenever you're thinking of a system as big as energy, because we're dealing with um, the trade of various products around the world, because not all of these types of minerals or resources are located within your particular country. You have to like import them in. And if we look at the production and processing of, reg of the, the regions, we can see like many of these areas are dominated in countries where right now there is a lot of political strife between the United States and Europe in some of these countries, which are leading to trade restrictions, particularly like graphite, titanium, silicon, the rare earths. I mean, the China, Russia, they command about 71% um, of that in the production and processing, right? Leaving, and I mean, nickel, we're much easier in copper, right? So we're not so bad, or palladium. But some of these aspects here, right? We, we need to think about this. This So this is a potential opportunity. Um, in terms of the uh, refining capacity, Main, uh, it's a little bit more broad out, but you could still see that the um, the alliance between some of these countries that have geopolitical strife with the United States and, and Europe, they command quite a bit, in particular the lithium, which is a, a little bit, could be a potential threat for entrepreneurs as they look to source this. All right, so now, given that we talked about some of the major challenges, I wanna now turn and talk about some of the entrepreneurship opportunities. And I'm gonna be giving some of the examples of entrepreneurs who've identified these and uh, talk about some of the technologies that they're doing. Um, before I get into this though, we need to also recognize that energy system has essentially four key pillars. There's this aspect of cleanliness or sometimes people call this sustainability, right? Um, in other words, what is the impact as we generate or energy on the air, the water, carbon emissions, sulfur, mercury. There's the availability of that type of energy resource. For example, if you're in a desert with no clouds, I mean, photovoltaic, I mean, you got a lot of sun. Whereas if you're in Germany, you know, <laughs> the sun's not available as often. So photovoltaic in terms of that is, it kind of limits you. This is more of a fixed geographic effect you have to think about, depending on where you're located, where you want to found your venture. Um, or invest in your company. The other two uh, the, um, is reliability and affordability. And so the idea then of this, of these is um, you need to focus on like balancing the availability, the reliability and the affordability, excuse me, the cleanliness, the reliability and affordability while also controlling for that availability, right? Now, most of the focus it turns out has been on the sustainability of cleanliness so far. And if you think about the policy in Europe and in the United States and Canada, right? So this has actually left a large opportunity for entrepreneurs to address the reliability and affordability issues related to this energy transition. So I'll be focusing quite a bit on those two aspects. Um, okay, so we discussed that the mining and the refining of minerals. Uh, many of these are taking place in areas where there's gonna be, there are current trade restrictions and likely to be even larger in the future. So 
what does this mean for entrepreneurs? Well, you can invest in types of mines, right? And one of the things is you could differentiate on sustainability because the type of mining in, at least by in what we find in Western countries, as well as run by Western companies, they're actually more clean and have better um, safety than say other types of mines run by um, foreign companies in some foreign countries. Um, you can invest in maybe the refining here in the United States. So an example is like this Tesla um, has, this is like the, the sketch, they've already broken ground for a massive lithium refinery in Texas. Um, and you know, there's other things, you, they tried deep sea mining, but that hasn't really panned out, little success. But there was this recent PNAS article suggesting that space mining could actually be a foray because they wouldn't have to worry about the environmental impact Right, uh, we'll see if uh, I guess Elon Musk decides to invest in that also. But you're wondering like, okay, so where's he gonna get this lithium? If he's gonna do the refining here, where's he gonna import this from? Because I just, we just, as we saw, a lot of this lithium is being controlled and mined in countries uh, where there's current trade restrictions. So maybe we don't have to look too far beyond just our own aquifers here in the United States for one potential opportunity. Um, one area to look at is this is geothermal brine. Okay, so in many areas, especially in the West, um, the brine that's used, the hot water to turn the turbines for geothermal, they actually have a lot of lithium chloride, which is a type of like a lithium, you know, a composite, which can be turned into lithium carbonate, which can then be sold to like a refinery to make like the lithium hydroxide. And we're actually seeing this right now. Controlled Thermal Resources is a new venture that is partnering with uh, Calpine's uh, um, geothermal plants in the Salton Sea to divert some of that after it goes through the turbines, take that hot water, take out that lithium ions and while the rest of it gets repumped back down in the reservoir. And then they can actually take that and, and take that lithium carbonate and then send it off to the refinery. Now, this is not the only place. I mean, we have many existing geothermal plants also in the ring of fire. And a lot of this actually was due to thanks of like Union Oil Company of California and Chevron who built most of these geothermal plants. Um, and so here's another opportunity to actually partner with them because it's a, there's a high likelihood that where you find hot water for geothermal, you're gonna find the lithium ions because it's that mixture of the crust of the earth that can bring that lithium up right, that's close to the surface, we're going to find the lithium. So I think that's a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs. Now, here's another one I want to talk about is maybe not just that, but sometimes there are these brine seawater deposits left over for millions of years ago. And one of them that's getting a lot of attention right now is called the smackover formation, which you can see here runs through southern Arkansas, a little bit in Texas and through uh, Mississippi. So Abermar, a large mining company, has already put 540 million investment in, and Exxon's just announced a 120,000 acre lease. Um, the idea is that you can that in, go down into this well where this brine is, pump out the water, and do the same thing you would do with the geothermal, except it's not hot, and you just extract that lithium um, uh, carbonate, and then send it off to a, a refinery. Um, and then repump re that water back into the brine. So like standard lithium, which is already a major player in this and is starting to pump out, believes that they can produce 21,000 kilotons of lithium, or excuse me, 21,000 tons of lithium carbonate per year. And Exxon believes that it can also do even better because of its enhanced drilling technology, its capability. So we'll see how this goes out. But I mean, this is, I mean, this is an, an excellent way in which we can address some of the mineral constraints from like the geopolitical threats. It's just looking for new ways to mine and obtain these technologies. And it could just be, well, right underneath our feet. Okay, so then let's talk about the wind and solar intermittency because I'm gonna do this just to show some of the possible opportunities here. Um, one of the things as we've seen is, um, as we've gone more and more into wind and solar, as particularly for those that run the electric power grids, they've had to now monitor the reliability of the energy because wind is extremely variable. Now this is like the ERCOT. So this is the entity in Texas that monitors and maintains the grid reliability. 
And you can see it has like an average um, of about 35% in Texas, which you can see Texas is actually the state that has the largest amount of wind energy production. But look at the massive variation. And by the way, these are this is like by week down there, that bar, 1st of December, 8th of December. You could have like a full week or almost a full week of like where there's just very little wind and you're dropping from a 35% down to like 10%. Well, what do you do? I mean, that's really difficult to cover that. Um, now, this is this is uh, just kind of like show like in terms of electric demand, that was supply and here's demand, right? So we have like the wind and the solar, the solar is that bright yellow, right? And nuclear is that base load tech, uh, energy source down below. But in particular, this is where we had this problem in Texas where the uh, <laughs> they start having the blackouts um, was when the wind went down and got super cold and electric demand spiked because people were freezing, right? And, they, and some of the even natural gas supplies actually failed because they weren't weatherized. And so what's, what's caused people to do after this incident, and for many um, people in the uh, energy industry, it's caused us now to look beyond what's called the levelized cost of energy and to focus on the effective load carrying capacity of energy, especially as we move more into these intermittent renewables. And so this is now gonna determine actually your investment. So those of you who are thinking about going into finance also and doing mergers and acquisition deals, for the people I speak with, the partners running these M&A deals, they've now told me that they will not do now because they've moved actually the M&A and the the finance has moved to this effective load carrying capacity for instead of the levelized cost. They won't do deals now unless there's a PPA, a purchasing power agreement of supply of electricity for when the wind stops blowing or when the sun is down. It's just that doesn't work anymore, right? Um, so the four hour, and one of the limitations too is like, you know, a four hour battery storage, which is the typical of our lithium ion battery. So, you know, that only works for maybe daily intermittency for the solar, but not for the huge variation in wind. Now let's just move, like some of the things, like we're not the only one facing this. Germany's also got this problem with the Die Dunkelflaute, right? The dark doldrums where, you know, the demand's still there and you can see it's like daily there up and down as people wake and go to sleep. But you have this massive amount that's just not being filled. Um, and what this has led to as more, as, uh, as more, as they invest more and more in these intermittent renewables, you'll see that the, the price of electricity has also gone up. So not only is it like a reliability issue, but now it's become an affordability issue. Right? And we also see this in the state of California where our electric prices now are even rival or above the average price of 35 cents a kilowatt hour that, uh, that, uh, that Germany has. So why is that? Well, this is, the, this is the main reason why. So and this is just using California as like a thing. Um, the consequences of this intermittent inter, um, energy is that we have to overbuild using this effective load carrying capacity. So if you want to produce 50 gigawatts of load carrying capacity, you need to build 245 gigawatts of solar, wind, and storage, right? That's the guarantee that amount of energy. Now, for someone who's in like the solar and wind, I feel like that, that's great. That means I could actually, you know, overbuild and I can make the case utilities why I have to overbuild and they have to like pay upfront that in like the, the contracts that they strike with them. Yeah, that's true, right? But this is also, it could lead to another other opportunities to deal with this, maybe at even a lower cost than overbuilding because this is extremely expensive. And then it's charged off to the rate payers. And at some point the rate payers are gonna say, it's just too much, it's too hot, right? Um, so they're either overbuilding or adding guest peakers, but again, that's also expensive because they only run a little bit of time. So you have to account for that return on assets and make that upfront capital cost. And again, back to the batteries right now, we don't have a viable solution. So think about this, this could be for long-term battery, meaning like multiple days, not just for the four hours, right? And I'm sure uh, uh, Melissa can talk about, she just, she's in the battery. So I'm gonna, I didn't do much in batteries. I'm gonna let her talk about the battery research because she's very familiar with that. So I'm gonna talk about some other options that are on the table here, which can be some interesting op entrepreneurial opportunities um, where also you might be able to uh, capitalize on some of the credits, tax credits from the recent Inflation Reduction Act on green hydrogen. So there's a lot of research, a lot of investment right now in new ventures 
that are looking to use um, green hydrogen production as a way for long storage energy source. Because, because the way hydrogen is, it's very difficult to transport because you can't put it in a steel pipe. Being in the world's smallest molecule, it actually leaches through the steel, and as it does so, it makes it brittle. So you have to have specialized uh, either carbon or ceramic type to, to actually store hydrogen. So what we found with hydrogen, it's best just to create it and store it on site rather than transport it because the costs are extremely high. But this can then lead to pos possibilities, right? What if you can produce this hydrogen where there's excess electrons on the market, say during the middle of the day in California where the price of the electron is zero, right? It can be used to uh, produce hydrogen, which can then be used um, to produce electricity later on, right? So these are some of the things and like depending on the storage, maybe you could get multiple days of this type of energy. So this is one, one area where there's a lot of investment going in and a lot of entrepreneurs are racing to try to figure out the best way to do this. Um, okay, so I already talked about that. Um, another thing that they talked about is like, okay, so you know, if we think about, and, and just moving on to this hydrogen aspect, like, well, maybe there are other ways we could store it. Maybe we can convert it into ammonia. Now, Neom, which is a company that has moved to Saudi Arabia and with massive, basically Saudi Aramco money, is making these investments to try to see whether they can convert it into ammonia um, and use that as a storage device. Uh, I just saw a recent technology that could be actually phenomenal, and that's here at USC, actually, from the chemistry department. They're converting it into acetic acid. And then they have this like little, looks like a coffee maker, where you could take that, ac uh, that acetic acid and just convert it right into hydrogen whenever you need it. And their argument is like, hey, you know, uh, if you had just this, imagine if you just had acetic acid in a, um, like a Toyota hydrogen car, right? With this little device in the middle, right? You could have even more hydrogen and go, you know, a thousand miles because it's in a liquid form instead of like the gaseous form, which right now is used and it's actually hard to find. Um, but in a liquid form, you know, maybe that could be easier. So there's huge opportunities for catalyst discovery, transport, and storage. I do want to talk about this other company right here, which is HIF. Um, I interviewed the executives on this, and they're doing something very similar to what Deoxycycle uh, is doing, except um, they're focusing heavily on this, like going to e-fuels um, using um, green hydrogen. And their idea is, is that we're just going to produce the green hydrogen from the uh, wind power. And then with that green hydrogen, we will take carbon dioxide from some supplier and then build up those large carbon chain plants. In fact, they've already got a contract with Porsche to supply this essentially renewable gasoline or diesel fuel to Europe for this. And they've got now, um, this is their pilot plant in Chile, but they're right now building out a massive plant in Galveston, Texas. Now, when I spoke to the executive last year about this, he's like, he was quite excited about it, but he said, here's our problem. There's just not enough uh, electrolyzers on the market. I mean, you have Siemens and some other small players, but they're booked out for the construction of these electrolyzers years in advance. And he said, our problem is if we can't get to scale fast enough, we will never be economically viable because it's all about scale. And right now, the biggest holdup for us are the electrolyzers. That's just something to think about. I mean, uh, as as uh, you know, lo looking at the green hydrogen and what you need, scale is important, but also these electrolyzers. Now, here's another opportunity that's kind of like low technology, but with low technology, right? That means the capital costs are lower, and so this represents actually a large entrepreneurial opportunity for those that are smart enough and want to jump into this. This is the idea of pump storage, right? So this is essentially taking like a reservoir that, um, and then using that as the battery. So during the day, when there is this, these elect uh, excess electrons, you pump water up. And then at, when you need it, you can pump it down. And depending on the size of the reservoir, there could be like multi-day type of um, storage, right? So there are opportunities for existing res reservoirs and old mines. And I, I do work in hydropower research right now. And it's what's interesting is that 90% of existing dams and reservoirs 
are used for services such as like, you know, just to prevent flooding or for agriculture. But guess what? They have no turbines. All right. So what does that mean? That means that they could be used as like a pump storage device or any type of energy generation. There are 12 gigawatt potential of these existing dams and reservoirs in the United States. Um, let me give you an example of a new venture that's doing this right now. Ride Development is transforming an old Kentucky coal mine into about 400 megawatts of storage for surplus wind power. And it's just fascinating because they had these open pit mines for coal and some mine shafts. And all they're doing is just, just uh, exploiting the, the difference in elevation of these open pit mines for the water that's just going to go pump back and forth, right? Capital costs are not that high compared to like the green hydrogen and uh, like uh, building out, you know, those renewable fuels, right? This is something that can be done with just piping and pumps and turbines. On that same note, I just also have to give a pitch for hydropower um, because notwithstanding you've heard the news, right, that we're now removing dams. You saw the Klamath River dams were, have been removed to see um, whether this can help the salmon. Um, it, we can do hydro, but not actually build dams. So one of the things that's happened in the 80s and 90s and even the 2000s is we've had a bit of a hydropower renaissance in the United States with what's called run of the river. So as you can see here, what the idea of this is, there is no dam or reservoir. You're just diverting a portion of the water from up a uh, higher elevation, and then you run it down to some turbine below, right? And um, this, is, this is fascinating because it, just so you know, like it's not the amount of water, it's just all, I mean, the amount matters somewhat, but it's, it's all about the elevation pitch. So you could take a stream, and by the way, this is the case in the county where I grew up in, uh, in Idaho, uh, there's a nice run of the river that runs essentially seven miles from the top of a mountain all the way down to the valley, dropping about 5,000 elevation pitch, right? And that generates well over 30 megawatts of electricity for not that much water. And it's just because of it's the potential from the elevation drop. There is estimated to be 53 gigawatts of untapped hydro energy in the United States, mainly through this run of the river sources. And the nice thing is, because there's no dam, the capital and regulatory costs, like meaning the environmental issues, are significantly lower without a reservoir. So this is actually a really cool and um, type of entrepreneurial opportunity that I want to highlight to look at. Okay, another one is this idea of the biofuels and biomass. Now, this was really big in the 2000s when we had our big energy um, spike, right, right before 2008 crisis. And, we had a couple bills passed in the federal government to spur more ethanol and biodiesel um, use. They put some mandates in and some uh, tax credits. Um, it's, it's since gone down until more recently, at about uh, two years ago, when the state of California, <laughs> with its uh, carbon uh, you know, laws the, the, um, to restrict the amount of carbon being used in our economy, has basically caused a massive importation of vegetable and animal oils into the state. In fact, we've already had five refineries in the state of California convert from being petroleum to essentially biofuel refineries, where they're taking these animal fats and just refining them. Now, this is the predicted amount share of um, transport and demand of biofuels across some major countries. You see Brazil's the leader. They have been, if you want to know why that's the case, it's because when they were a, a, a dictatorship in the late 70s and early 80s and being essentially shunned by most countries. They wanted to be energy independent because they're afraid that they would have the petroleum shut off to their country. And so the dictatorship basically said, uh, we're going to, we want every vehicle to run on 100% ethanol and all vehicles built that way. And we're going to produce and develop the largest ethanol industry in the world because they grow a lot of sugar cane. And that's what they have right now. So um, you can go to Brazil, you could buy any car, it could be run on 100% ethanol, and you could actually buy ethanol at any pump station. Okay, but here's the deal. With these renewable fuels, like the costs are significantly um, higher, which is something we have to deal with, right? And so as you look here, these are the actual, you can see this line right here is the jet fuel just from fossil fuels. But, and there is like a premium cost depending on where you're getting that biofuel from. Obviously, you can see that the cooking oil, used cooking oil, is the lowest cost for this. Here in California, particularly at the Los Angeles International Airport, they've been using now 
a, a bio renew what they call renewable jet fuel made from mainly used cooking oil and some soybean oil to power the fuels because especially many of these european airlines they have a mandate now in europe that they need to fly with renewable uh basically carbon neutral type of fuel so i see this as growing this is going to be a continued growth opportunity um mainly due to these government rules that are restricting carbon um, so this is the projected of the IEA of used cooking oil and fats are going to actually rise. I think, I think we'll actually, I mean, they're going to say, and I believe this is true, that by about 2026, we will probably use every drop of like <laughs> fry oil for McDonald's. Like we won't be able to get any more. This is what I worry then at that point, though, is that this vegetable oils, right, are actually going to rise. Now, the IEA doesn't have this on there, and I think they're a little bit mistaken because I think that curve's actually going to start rising in 2024. I think it's actually rising now. This is data only from 2022. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities for biomass biofuels, and, um, you know, it's look low capital expenditures, right, because especially if you look for these inputs from the waste streams, but it's all about figuring out, like, what hasn't been tapped yet, okay? But be careful because as we push too much into this and we use like the like the the virgin vegetable oils, right? Then you get into this idea of like the fuel farming where we start creating an elevated price of of um, the vegetables used for eating, right? Uh, for food, right? And at that point, that could become a problem. So just be careful about that. All right, now here's an untapped opportunity that is growing, and it's grown for the last three or four years. And this is idea of biogas. So Methane is produced from landfills, sewage treatment facilities, and farms, particularly like dairy farms and uh, pig farms or anywhere where you have like a lot of animals that are kind of caged up, right? And the idea is that you could capture, clean that natural gas and either generate electricity or take that natural gas, that methane, and pump it back into a pipe where there's methane and it could be sold as like a carbon neutral methane gas. Right now, if you look at that, you know, the infrastructure capital has to be there. This is why most of the time it's being generated into electricity, because usually there's no natural gas pipeline. Um, but this is a prime opportunity for entrepreneurship because the capital costs are relatively low compared to other ones. You're essentially like you see building a dome over a manure pit, capturing the methane and then figuring out what's the best opportunity. Can I, do I sell it to the natural gas utility? Or do I sell it at like generate electricity on site and then set up like a purchasing power agreement with some company who will buy these essentially what could be deemed as um, renewable electricity. Um, another one that we can look at, which is important, is under the ocean. So marine energy. Right? So water is 800 times denser than air. Right. Uh, there's a lot of work being done in tidal wave for the last 30 years, mainly in northern Europe, where the tides are very, uh, very, very high. Right. They actually get greater near the poles. Scotland is actually the leader of this. They have 100 different projects of tidal energy. Um, and uh, this what I love about this is that not only are they doing it there, but they're actually exporting the technology. So Mitsui OSK lines of Bombora Wave Power in Japan have basically, they're, they're licensing that technology from Scotland they developed. And as you can see, they're installing tidal um, plant or tidal, uh, gener wave gener tidal generators, excuse me, on the bottom of the seafloor. Um, and just to give you an idea, right? That little, that little blade right there can produce as much as maybe 50 blades of onshore electricity just because of the torque of the water, right? It's 800 times dense, denser. So um, I think there's a huge opportunity for marine energy that could address some of the issues um, that a lot of people have in terms of the nimbyism. They don't wanna see these big windmills in their backyard or offshore below the water where they spin slowly. And again, we gotta do more environmental assessments, but so far in Scotland, they're saying it has very little impact on marine life because it sits right above the seafloor. And again, it's you know, depends on, probably don't want to stick it on a coral reef or something, right? So I'm sure there, there are ways we got to look into this for the environmental impact. Um, but that, that could be a good opportunity. I want to talk also on geothermal energy. Uh, we mentioned this earlier with this idea of like using this also for lithium, right? What's great about geothermal is that it's a great source of dispatchable energy and like hydro 
you could turn it on, it could run it with reservoir at least, right? You could, this can run all the time. It's a base load energy source, yet it's not really, doesn't get much attention in this country. So much uh, attention is based on like solar and wind, which I mean, in my personal opinion, it's because I think that they got the biggest lobbying power. <laughs> um, but this is, this is actually a great energy source. And with the technology today, we could put geothermal energy sources in just about any state. Um, this, especially Colorado, which I could talk about in another thing, because I got a paper on geothermal and there's some issues that we have to address. I do want to talk about nuclear, though. I think that we're about to see a nuclear renaissance in this country and actually a major others because of the new, new technologies being developed. And the first one I want to talk about is small modular fission nuclear. New Scale is a new venture. It's a new company, um, about 10 years old, um, and they have developed essentially a what's called a small modular fission nuclear reactor. Now, technically, this technology isn't that new. Essentially, they're taking the same technology that runs our current nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers, and they're saying, well, if we can do it there, why don't we just set these up right anywhere, right? And so their idea is that they would take these 50 or 70 to 150 megawatt plants and then put them kind of like in parallel. So you could produce up to two gigawatts of electricity if you want, but they're in small modular parts. The nice thing of being about modular is that you mitigate the risk exponentially because it's like a one, it's a one over log type of effect. As the size goes down, the risk exponentially goes, uh, one over inverted log goes down even faster. So they've already got approval to sell 50 megawatt reactors Rocky Mountain Power already has struck a uh, contract with New Scale to develop a nuclear power plant in Utah for them. And they've got pilots right now running in Idaho. Another one, which again is based on an old technology we've had forever, but now is finally coming to market due to entrepreneurs who saw this opportunity. Um, this is the micro fission nuclear. And unlike the small modular, which is essentially like a, it's like a heavy water, it's got the, which produces the steam and drives a turbine. So it's, a, it's a, like the typical fission nuclear. This one has no moving parts. All you're using is the heat of the radioisotope and that heat diffusion over um, a long distance creates uh, electricity. This is the same technology that we have in our interstellar satellites like Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 that powers them <laughs> through space. Right? So the idea was like, hey, we've done this before. Like, why can't we do this and create electricity at a module? And here's like nano nuclears. This is their, what they, their prototype. They have this Zeus nano reactor that just sits on the back of a truck and can go to large events and generate 20 mega, megawatts of electricity. So let's say you need power at a certain source. They just drive these up. They're just like a generator and they're producing 20 megawatts. They're super small and portable. Um, we've got two other companies that are actually also involved, not just Nano, but Alo and Oklo. Now, what's interesting about Oklo, I, I find their, they, their differentiation strategy is that they're using fuel waste. So they're like, yeah, we're going to differentiate from Nano and Alo. We're going to take the old uranium from the existing nuclear power plants, and we've got a way that we could use them to still generate 20 megawatts with our own technology. And so they're working with the Idaho National Laboratory to like commercialize this and get that, that regulatory approval. But I suspect that in many states, I think that are open to nuclear right now, California is not for some reason, but there are other states. I know that Texas, uh, Utah, many of the Midwestern states, they're still open to these small uh, micro and um, modular nuclear. I, I think that we might see a renaissance here. And I think there's an opportunity, especially as we think about, we need that baseload, baseload energy Right, and if people are, are care about this carbon constrained world, how are we going to get that baseload energy? And nuclear is one way to do that. Um, so, all right, here's another opportunity, and it's the recycling of electric vehicles. So today, 90% of internal combustion engine cars are reused and recycled. Right, this is the real case. I don't know if you probably didn't know this, right? That, uh, but zero percent of EVs are. All right, what does this mean? Well, as we get more of these EVs on the road and they, you know, they hit their lifespan, what are we going to do with them? Are we going to stick them in a landfill? All right. So this is this is um, a huge opportunity for us. And so one of the questions we have to think about is how economically feasible. Let's work the numbers on this now. Due to some of the tax credits right now with the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Act, I believe that these can be economically viable because if you could really extract some of those minerals 
from the um, the motors as well as the, the batteries and reuse them, you will be able to get those tax credits. The question though is like, who's gonna lead this? Because it's all about scale when we're talking about recycling. Will China lead? I know they're making investments in this right now because they have the world's largest EV market. Some good investment areas, however, I think would be South Korea and Mexico uh, for the fact of its lower labor rates, uh, and also, if you think about the regulatory barriers, recycling batteries is a very dirty business. I mean, <laughs> and we, and depending on what state you're in, and also the, uh, the, the we have very high like environmental strategy, uh, rules that can make uh, regulatory costs higher. I'm not saying that you could go to these countries and like not, you know, not be environmental friendly, but there are large regulatory costs. But think about using these tax credits. I would, if you could develop the technology, I think like Northern Mexico, just across the border could be a great place to do this because of the lower labor rates. Now we have a three or four companies right now just recently founded that see the opportunity. One is Redwood Materials by J.D. Straubel, former Tesla exec. He opened his first facility in Nevada in 2023. It's like a pilot facility, but he signed an agreement with Toyota. You can see right there, he's got old Toyota Prius batteries um, that he wants to recycle. There's Lifecycle Holdings and Rochester, they have a big facility actually in Canada across the, um, the, the Great Lake. And there, they're, you know, they started with like personal computers, but now they're uh, personal electronics. Now they're moving to automobiles. But I think that this is going to be a huge opportunity, not just for batteries, but also electric motors, right? So think about the entire supply chain of recycling of like an EV. Um, the last thing I want to talk about before we get to the question and answer, because I know we're running out of time here. Um, is carbon offset markets. So you've, you've had a couple of new ventures talking about how they are you know, taking carbon out and they're creating value from the products. There's still value also for companies who want to score higher on ESG to lower their carbon. And they're often doing this through carbon offset markets. Now, what's interesting, if you just kind of see this, right, the, the biggest um, carbon uh, emission, play, uh, emission, emission uh, people are energy, utilities, consumer ag, right? They're, they're emitting the largest amount of carbon uh, emissions. But what you're finding is like, it's kind of flipped, like those that are actually purchasing are those that probably emit the least, like Microsoft, JP Morgan, right? Um, Airbus, which again, it fits in this aerospace and defense. So this is, um, what this means is that there could be a lot possible, but for many reasons, carbon companies are shying away from carbon credits and why? because there's just a bunch of different standards out there. There's carbon credit quality and transparency. In the US, this is essentially like a wild, wild west, right? The European Union has been doing this since 2004 and they have a better grasp on it. But because of the wild, wild west in the United States, there's a huge market opportunity for entrepreneurs to create recognized certifiers and market intermediaries, right? To go in and say, and track it. No, we really believe this is a true offset and we've got data to show it and we could track this for the entire time for your your reporting your accounting reporting um so i mean just just to give you an idea right there was this one uh company called uh vera right where it turned out that 90 percent of the rainforest carbon offsets <laughs> by the biggest certifier were completely worthless um so there is an opportunity to do that right to 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 either get into the business where you actually have a real carbon offset that you could track, and also if you want to be a certifier. So I think that that's an opportunity. So I think I'm gonna like basically stop right there, JK, because I've been talking for a very long time and I see there's some questions that Shannon might be good to, um, to hear from anybody else here. Um, but yeah, so please stay in touch. I'm on LinkedIn, also on Twitter. Uh, and uh, would love to hear any questions you have. Thank you so much, uh, Sean, for that tour de force. Um, I'm waiting for my video to come back on, but uh, in the meantime, um, I'd like to start off with a question. Um, it's just really amazing how comprehensively you laid out sort of the gauntlet of challenges and points of the opportunities for entrepreneurs in this space. Um, but given the capital intensity of these renewable projects, 
Um, how can startups compete, do you think, against incumbents with very large internal capital markets in this space? Or do you think, are there areas in renewables where startups simply aren't the optimal organizational form to pursue novel innovations? Yes, I think that there are some areas where the capital investments are extremely high. Um, and unless you had like some angel investors, it's probably not the best one. But that's why I think that there's a lot of low tech opportunities, for example, like the biogas extremely low tech <laughs> doesn't require that much capital investment um the same thing is think about the biofuel industry or bio you know i mean essentially if you can go pick up like the the, the vegetable oil and truck it over to a bio refiner I mean, you could be the the ones that somehow can corner that market and sign these contracts so there's lots of opportunities where you could be a part of this um, but not necessarily like be the ones that do all the massive investment into the new technologies, which could require massive amounts of capital. That's oh, the other one I was going to say is like the hydro. I think hydro is like the low, given that there's no reservoir, like run of the river hydro or just putting a turbine on an existing reservoir to do a pump storage. That's something that entrepreneurs can do with, with some investment. I mean, you could probably get a small business loan to do that 10 million SBA loan and set up like a pumped reservoir. That's, that's amazing. So the, um, the older the tech, if you'd like, uh, the less de-risking there is. You 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 feel that that's that's sort of going to reduce the capital costs and therefore be a more viable uh, entry route for entrepreneurs. It seems. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Um, I'd like to now open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, there is a question from Zhao Li, who I'll mention is uh, an assistant professor at the management department, a dear colleague of mine. I also note that she is an expert in hydro uh, hydraulic fracturing. Her question is inspired by your mentioning of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, tax credits. Um, and her question is, there goes my video. What do you oh, think I'm is back. the, <laughs> nice to meet you again. Uh, what do you think is the appropriate role of the US government, federal and subnational in facilitating the energy transition? And how should companies inform policymakers of the opportunities and risks during this transition? Well, I'm going to start with the second point first. Um, that's because that's a little bit less controversial. Um, I think that companies have a better idea of like what's needed for an energy transition and how long it's going to take than any generally government bureaucrat um, because they're actually in the business. This is their livelihood. And so they know what it takes. Uh, I was just, I had a few interviews like the last couple of days regarding the, the Chevron acquisition of Hess, right? And they wanted to ask like, why are oil companies doing this? And I said, well, because the oil companies realize that notwithstanding peak oil projected in the year 2030, they're going to still be using oil for the next 20 to 30 years at a pretty high volume rate. Like, I mean, even the Energy Information Agency, the United States run out of the Department of Energy, predicts that by the year 2040, the average scenario is that it's going to be 98 million barrels of oil demand, right, per year. Um, or excuse me, per day. If you look at it today, we're at 102. Okay, so so we're going to go from here, 2023 to 98 by the year 2040. That's only a four million barrel per day difference, right? Four percent, right? So to me, that says yeah, it's still going to be there. And what are these companies doing? This goes back to the IRA, right? Now there's like these incentives. And so you're seeing that the smart energy companies, which is, I, I actually, I teach this right now, which is fun. Um, and one of my, uh, these energy classes we're launching here at USC. And it's just this idea of like, if you're like an oil and gas company, how do you react to these policies and how do you react to the energy transition? And of course, the, what we teach in strategy, the basic principles is, well, what is your core competence, right? What are your capabilities? Because every type of diversification should be based on that or you're making a massive misallocation of capital. You won't get that return. And so I like to compare Shell with Chevron. <laughs> so uh, most people don't know that Chevron has a history of being in renewable energy, a long history, right? That through their acquisition of Union Oil Company of California, the first developer of geothermal in this country in the geysers regions of California, 1958 on, right? They've been building you know, geothermal plants throughout the entire world. And some of you are wondering, like, oh, well, why did they do that? Well, it was sort of like this. Well, they went to the Philippines, Indonesia and stuff and said, hey, give us a lease for your petroleum <laughs> and we'll build you a geothermal plant because we have the technology. We have the drilling capability and we could do it really well. We can identify the hot spot and with one drill, we'll do it. Done. Right. Um, so this 
and, and so they're still doing that. And now you can see Exxon with the drilling technology is doing with the lithium. They're doing in the biofuels because they already have that refining capability. Once you do, you know, just need an oil, right? And then you could just crack it and build whatever type of petroleum output that you need, or excuse me, I'm going to say petroleum, but but a liquid fuel, right? Whatever you need. So um, I I think that these companies see it. They see that there is a possible because of these um, government regulations of this lower carbon transition is how I like to call it. And so they are diversifying, but in a smart way. I think they're going slow because they realize that there's still going to be a need of petroleum. So we're going to still do that, but we're also going to move to the slower, what we see as opportunities for a lower carbon energy. And it's in like a very managed way. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> I think that they actually should listen to companies, all the companies, right? Not just like, I think that's the problem with, with bureaucrats is, you know, it's all theory. It's sort of like us as professors, right? We're in our ivory tower and we decide something and we say that this is the way it should be. But, you know, if you don't have a good like connection with with um, with the business, with the practitioners, right, then maybe you don't really realize what's going on. So that second question, um, what do you think is the appropriate role of the U.S. government in facility the energy transition? Well, um, you know, I think that's up for debate for everybody, right? I mean, there are different ways you could do it. You could do it for like regulatory. Yeah, right now we're doing like this in like massive amounts of um, money through these incentives, and it is leading to a change, right? We're seeing them make these investments. Um, I think just stepping back, though, and looking at our current fiscal mess that we have, and I am going to call it a mess because we're running a $1.8 trillion deficit and a non-recession economy, and we printed $600 billion of debt, right, or just in the last few months. It just issued $600 billion of treasuries. And then we're seeing the rates go high because there's just not enough buyers out there. I'm, I'm very worried on our current trajectory, if you look at this, that we're going to face a debt crisis. So at some point, using the carrot approach, at least if it's deficit spending, is not very wise, I think, for this country. I don't think that we can actually do it. I think we're going to run into some massive problems fiscally in this country. So it I think it's likely better move if they're going to push this to move to more of a regulatory stick because on the carrot end, we don't have any more carrots. We're borrowing carrots, right? So, so this is a, an issue that we have right now. It, it seems like we've got about two minutes left. So in, in, in the limited uh, time, uh, first off, that was an amazing answer. Um, um, oh, actually, there is another question uh, that's in the chats uh, from Ada Benzeria. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Seeing as the population growth and demand for energy is a big part of this, and mostly the solutions currently are focused on addressing those needs, do you see any space for consumer awareness and lifestyle management to help in balancing that? Oh, that is an excellent entrepreneurial opportunity. I didn't even have it on there, was that consumption aspect. And I think the reason why I'm a strategist, if I were like a marketing professor, I'd be focusing on that consumption aspect, right? But absolutely, I think uh, there is an entrepreneurial opportunity there. Awesome. Um, I, I think we ask a follow up question so just super quick. Please. I was so excited that you talked about geothermal because I don't know if you know this, but like years ago, I did a, a S curve study and on renewable energies and hadn't even intended to look at geothermal, but we got sent that data along with the other data that we were looking at, which was wind power and photovoltaics. And you know, much to our surprise, geothermal was an incredible technology and had a much better you know, efficiency path than the other two technologies. And so I, like you, I was very surprised, like, why aren't we seeing more geothermal? So I went to the USPTO database, I pulled all the patents on ge geothermal in the US and discovered, like you just kind of pointed out, it's all the oil companies own all the tech, developed all the technology for geothermal, which when you think about it makes total sense because who knows how to land survey and pump and drill, right? It's oil companies. And so I think what, you know, clearly what must be the case is that currently oil is more profitable than electricity generated by a geothermal. And so what do you do about that? I mean, that, that to me, I guess it takes maybe regulation to step in on that and make it so that electricity is more profitable than, than oil. Or like, I guess, tax policy, they talk about a carbon tax, right? And again, yeah. I'm telling you, we don't have any more carrots. So I don't think we can we can continue to throw out these massive trillion dollar deficit spending stuff. Like maybe we need to raise revenue and cut our spending, and maybe that's the best way. But yeah, because it strikes me that they know how to do it, but they've chosen not to, and that yes. you know you have to somehow address that behaviorally. That's exactly right. It's because economically, right, it's still very profitable 
to be in yeah. control. This was so awesome, Sean. Thank you so much, JK. Yeah. And thank you, Sean. I learned so much during your talk. My God, I, I'm going to save the video and I actually want to make my students watch it. So this was really, really terrific. It was, a, you know, couldn't think of a better way to cap off the end of this uh, conference today. So thank you to both of you very much for coming. Thank and you. Thank you for inviting me. Sure thing. And I just want, also want to thank all of our viewers. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you to Liz Chen, who without her, this there's no way this would happen. And to our awesome IT staff who are actually working stealthily in the background to make sure that everything's working. And also thank you, of course, to the Fubon Corporation for sponsoring the Fubon Center, who who in you know then therefore sponsors this conference. Without them, this wouldn't be possible. And then I want to ask all of you to uh, mark your calendars. November 14th, we have a uh, AI talk. It will be hosted by Foster Provost, and he runs a demystifying AI speaker series. And the, the, the topic for November 14th is, is AI a threat to the creative professions? A look at AI and music industries with a, with a practitioner expert, Howie Singer, and Foster Provost are going to look at that on November 14th. So mark your calendars. And thank you again for joining us.